The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 21, reading through verse 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who was my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is, in, is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless Even the youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we pray for ears to hear. Ears that hear your words and quickly forget whatever words I place in the way. Give us eyes to see what you have for us, hearts open to receive it. And Holy Spirit, may you speak to us through these words of Holy Scripture. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. The longer I live, and I guess especially the more I do things like funerals, the more I notice just how out of sorts life can get in the wake of pain, grief, sorrow, really just any general sense of negativity. It's almost, for those of us who go through it, it's as if the world around us just sort of stops spinning. As if we'll never be able to get on with our lives. Like, like there's never going to be any sense of normalcy or happiness ever again. And to some degree, this is normal. Take the young lover who experiences the sting of their first heartbreak believing they'll never find true love again, that all the joy in the world has been drowned in an ocean of tears as they listen to Taylor Swift albums. (laughs) It's normal. It's normal to grieve the passing of a loved one, especially if it's a tragic passing. It's normal to grieve for a time. And for most of us, this feeling of being stuck, these feelings of futility and hopelessness, They tend to pass with time and the healing presence of other people in our lives. But there are those of us. Those of us for whom the days never seem to grow brighter. The world never seems to be set right. Those of us for whom every day is just another periodic reminder of the darkness from which we cannot escape. Like the daughter in her 60s now who cannot let go of the grief that came with her mother's death some 15 years ago. The shadow of her despair lingers in the corners of her home, and 
every picture on the wall and every small shrine on an end table to her long departed mother. It creeps its way into every conversation. Well, you know, Mama used to say, Mama used to do. It creeps its way with every drag of the cigarette, with every swig of water to wash down the pills. For her, the earth was thrown off its axis the day her mother died. And from that time on, she sort of wallowed in the dark shadow of that pain, never allowing the realities of life and even death realities of time to heal her heart. Or the ex-husband, the one who didn't see it coming, the one who after 20 years and two kids comes home to find a note stuck on the refrigerator door. 20 years and all he got was a letter. 20 years, all he gets is a note followed by a visit to a lawyer's office. 20 years and all he got was an occasional drop-in from the kids where he'd try to weasel out a little bit of gossip. What's your mama been up to? She's seeing anybody? What's going on? It's been 20 years now since that day. He still keeps his ring in his pocket, still keeps her picture tucked away in his wallet. And when the kids do drop in, he winces whenever they mention her new last name. For him, that day was the beginning of the end, the first day he began to look forward to his last. For some of us, we just can't crawl out of the darkness. There are those people for whom there seems to be no escaping the tragedies of life and the repercussions that follow. Like these people, these people in our text this morning, the ones who believe that they were in fact God's special people, a chosen nation, blessed and untouchable they believed that theirs was a nation that would continue on forever and ever and ever. That life would be easy. But then Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came knocking on the wall. Nebuchadnezzar led his forces right into Jerusalem, right into their capital, raided the temple, took all the nice stuff, left all the cheap paper plates and the plastic forks, but took the good stuff. Came in, took all the leaders out, all the folks with any money, any power, any influence. Took them all and left the rest behind to figure it out. And these folks in exile, these people of God began to despair. To believe that the world as they knew it, or at least the world as they wanted it, was over. They were surrounded in this land by foreign idols that belonged to others. They were surrounded by the visible signs that they had lost and by extension that their God had lost. They were reminded with each new day that they were not home and that they probably wouldn't be going home. And that in the grand scheme of geopolitical power, this chosen nation, these blessed people of God, well, they were nothing more than a pawn on a chessboard. For so many of them, all that was left was to accept their fate, to slump into this belief that God had lost and God was now gone. And with God, he took hope and the joy of the future they once envisioned. Into this supposed hopelessness, into this void of joy, into this darkness that they had just sort of accepted upon themselves, the prophet speaks these words. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It's he who sits above the circle of the earth, who brings princes to naught, makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. It's as if the prophet is saying to him, look, 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 while you've been wallowing in exile, giving in to what you perceive as the inevitability of defeat and assimilation. Have you forgotten what you were told when you were little? Have you forgotten all the songs you used to sing in Sunday school? You worried about everything in the newspaper, everything going on in the empire? Have you forgot he's got the whole world in his hands, right? That's why I was singing the choir. <coughs> Have you forgotten? That's what he's saying. Have you forgotten about the very nature of God? 
You're worried about the power of princes, presidents, dictators, emperors. Have you forgotten God's above all of that? You don't worship a God, the prophet says to the people, whose fate is determined by the outcome of war's fault, of laws passed. Yours is a God who hangs the sky like a curtain in the guest room, spreads it out like a pup tent for a weekend getaway. Yours is a God who by mere presence shows the reality of the way things are. That the people of earth are really just like grasshoppers. Here today, gone tomorrow, rulers come and go and are easily forgotten as their memories fade with the ink of history books. The prophet arrives just in the midst of these people believing that all is gone, their hope is over. And he reminds these exiled people that their God is beyond their present pain. That their God has hope. And that hope is to be found in the very transcendent nature of God. Now I think the truth of that reality, of God's transcendence, is one which we seem to lose over time. But not when things are going bad. No. It seems we lose sight of God's true transcendent nature when things are going well, when we're getting everything we want, when our ducks are in a row and everything is going according to our plans. It's in those times, I think, that we lose sight of the reality of God because it's in those times that we begin to take God for granted, that God must be blessing all that we're doing, that God is pleased with everything that we do and who we are. We buy into the inverted narrative of exile. For after all, if, if we're doing wrong and God punishes us and sends us into exile, well, surely if we're doing right and nothing bad is going on, then everything's okay. But think for me, think with me for a moment about these people in exile, the people to whom the prophet speaks. Were they exiled unfairly? Was this unexpected? Was the arrival of the Babylonians an accident of history? The inevitability of a world superpowered, consuming land and resources and people on its way towards global dominance? Were they being picked on? Little old Judah, big old Babylon, were they just picking on them? No. The Babylonian captivity, the Babylonian exile, sometimes we call it, was, according to the prophets, a direct result of the people of Judah's actions. Their actions towards the poor, the strangers, the vulnerable among them. And really, their overall greed. As far as the people were concerned, before the Babylonians arrived, everything was fine. The rich were getting richer, and the poor were keeping their mouth shut. And as far as they were concerned, They were fat and happy. So God must also be fat and happy. But we lose sight of God's nature, of God's calling on our lives when we don't have to wait on God to set everything right. When life glides on effortlessly, when things are without complication or confusion, that's when we begin to misunderstand the true nature of God. Because it's in those seasons of our lives when we can so easily fall into believing that everything has been stamped and approved by God. And that's really why, I'm convinced, it's really why we begin to doubt and question and fear when troubles come. Because we've taken it for granted that when there aren't troubles, that means everything is okay. That God has blessed everything. It's why the prophet says... Why do you say, O Jacob? Why do you speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God. Why all of a sudden do you think your way is hidden from the Lord? Do you think it was clear as crystal before? Why do you think now you've been disregarded by God? Was he just holding on to you so tightly before? Why all of a sudden... 
Because you've had to wait a little while in exile? And he repeats the refrain, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. It's as if the prophet is saying to the people, Why are you suddenly concerned about being hidden from God? Why do you suddenly think God has disregarded you? Don't you get it? God is above all of this. God is bigger than all of this. God is more than all of this. God made all of this. All of it. Can you really understand that? And then there are these great poetic lines. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. God gives power to the faint? Strength to the powerless? Youth will faint and the young will fall exhausted? I'm taking now that the Hebrew word for young and youth does not mean three. Because I got a three-year-old that never faints and is never falling exhausted. (laughs) But God gives power? Power to the faint, strength to the powerless. That doesn't make sense. Why would you waste it on them? Why would God grant power to those on the brink of passing out? Why would God grant strength to those without power? Why would God take the ultimate example of humiliation and defeat and use it to save the world? Why? Because those are the ones who need it. And they know it. You see, of course the youth will faint and grow weary. Because I have, I, have, I have news for you, in case you haven't heard. Youth goes away. I learned that in the fall. I'm 33, trying to play softball like I was 23. It doesn't work. Of course, the youth will faint and grow weary. They'll eventually grow old. They'll eventually be tired. They'll eventually be exhausted. All of us in this room, no matter how much energy you feel like you've got right now, you'll grow faint, you'll grow weary, you'll grow tired, and I've got some sad news. Eventually, you'll die. Of course, those who are carrying on in their lives, as if God has blessed every step they take and every decision they make, even they will eventually run out of breath. We all do. Every single one of us. But when the day comes when youth has disappeared, when strength has gone, when power has faded, and all we have left to do is wait, the prophet says, But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It turns out that we really don't get the nature of who God is until we have to wait for God. Until we have to understand that everything we think is our own, everything we think we deserve, everything we think we've earned, everything to which we believe we are entitled is nothing more than junk waiting to turn into dust. It turns out that we can really only find our strength when we realize we don't have any in the first place. That we can only soar to the heights of this life when we realize they're not what we think are the heights of this life. But are on an entirely different plane from the ones we use to measure success. That we can only walk and faint and not faint when we truly realize that we're really just too weak to even stand on our own. When things are going great, when everything is good, like I like to say, when life is a gravy train with biscuit wheels... We can give our religious obligations to God. It's easy. Show up for church, put a few dollars in the plate, say the blessing at the dinner table, only buy chicken sandwiches from Chick-fil-A, that sort of thing. When things are going good, we can give our obligations to God and believe that everything we have and everything we do is blessed and approved by the Almighty. But when things take a turn for the worse, and they always do, We can wallow in self-pity. We can linger for too long in the dark shadow of our own needs for reassurance and security. 
We can go through this life believing that it's in our hands, believing that every choice we make is somehow maybe predestined as a part of this complicated plan that God has set before the foundations of the world, and we're just experiencing it in real time. Or we can choose to believe that we worship a God who transcends our way of knowing. A God who could quite possibly hang the sky like a curtain and pitch a tent with the stars. A God who does not come and go with the fleeting notions of religion, politics, or culture. A God who does not grow weary with the passing of time. A God who does not grant strength to those who already wield it. But a God who does grant strength to the powerless and help to the helpless. A God who does not run by our clock with our rules according to our expectations. A God, as the prophet said, worth waiting for. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose very nature and Trinitarian relationship and eternal love transcends our very way of knowing and understanding. God, we are thankful. Even, Lord, when we fail to recognize our need, even when we fail to recognize that we cannot stand on our own, we are thankful, God, that you were there to hold us up. And help us, Lord, to not take you for granted when things seem to be going well, and to not cast all of our blame on you when things, when things turn dark. Help us, God, to realize you are worth our waiting as we wait even now for that day to come. So, Lord Jesus, move in our presence. Holy Spirit, call us to whatever decision is before us this morning. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.